Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> um, I'm reading to this morning, starting at, with in the hymnal on page 533, and it goes like this. I thank my God every time I remember you, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And that's from Philippians chapter one, it's verses three, six, nine, and through 11. I don't know about you guys, but as a parent, I held on to those verses that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. For my kids, held on to that, that he began the good work in them. And you know, at what point as a parent do you say, I'm not responsible for their behavior anymore, but let God bring it to completion. So we continue to pray to grow in our maturity for ourselves, for our families, for our friends and loved ones. Thank you, Lord, for starting the good work. Let's pray. Lord, we gather before you this morning as your family here at our small first church. We lift up our members, our friends, our loved ones to you. We pray that you take all of the elements of our service today. Lord, let each person who's here have ears to hear and eyes to see how you would have them be your instrument here in this place, in our town, in our workplaces. Lord, equip us, send us out, to do the good works that you have started for us. We praise you and we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name, amen. We're starting with And you can turn in your Bibles to the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John. Let's ask the Lord's blessing upon his word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is a light unto our path. And it leads and guides us through this life. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Speak to our souls. Bless us each according to your purpose and plan for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we read the scripture, I want to create a little atmosphere. Here's the scene. They had just left the upper room the Last Supper, where Jesus had gotten down on his knees, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet, even Judas's feet. And Judas had been identified and prompted, entered by Satan to go and to betray the Lord Jesus. He left the room. And Jesus said to Peter three times before the cock crows, you will disown me, you will betray me. And he taught and he taught and he taught them many deep truths and deep things. And they were ready for it. They were practically ready for it. No, they were ready for it. And he made promises to them. And one important promise for us to consider this morning is this. In John 14, 26, it says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And so they leave the, uh, the upper room and they're going to Gethsemane, where Jesus will pray and struggle over his will or the Father's will. And the path that they took was through the Mount of Olives. And on that walk, they came to a vineyard. And this is where Jesus teaches them once again. John 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. 
You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus begins this teaching moment by claiming to be the true vine. I am the true vine. In the Old Testament, there are many references to a vine in a vineyard, and they refer to Israel. In Hosea chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, we read this, How prosperous Israel is a luxuriant vine loaded with fruit, but the richer the people get, the more pagan altars they build, the more bountiful their harvests, the more beautiful their sacred pillars. The hearts of the people are fickle. They are guilty and must be punished. The Lord will break down their altars and smash their sacred pillars. That is taken from the New Living Translation. And Psalm 80, verses 1 through 4. Now I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land, cleared its stones, and planted it with the best vines. In the middle, he built a watchtower and carved a wine press in the nearby rocks. Then he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes that grew were bitter. Now you, people of Jerusalem and Judah, you judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard that I have not already done? When I expected sweet grapes, why did my vineyard give me bitter grapes? The vineyard produced bitter grapes because the vine was bitter at its root. The people's hearts are fickle. They're unstable. The wickedness of the heart of man, the ungratefulness of the people of Israel for the work that the vine dresser, the gardener, would do. Plow the land, clear the stones, planted it with the best vines. And Jesus says at this point, I am the true vine. There are seven things in the, new, in the Gospel of John that Jesus uses and begins with, I am. If you recall from the Old Testament, I am meant, I am God. And Jesus referring to himself, I am the true vine. In one aspect, he is making himself, re revealing himself to be deity. In the others that he mentions in the Gospel of John, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I am the resurrection and the life. And finally, I am the true vine, the Messiah. And now he's teaching about grapes and he's teaching about vines. The, in the vineyards, as you look at what they look like, you expect to see sprawling, crawling craziness with a vine. I know I've got this stuff in my yard called bittersweet, and it's awful if you've ever had to deal with it. 
It goes everywhere. Up, over, under, around, just controlling everything. Well, Jesus is talking about vines in a vineyard. And the vine was actually, is actually like a stalk, a trunk, that comes up out of the ground. And vineyard owners keep their, their, their vines, their grape plants, if you will, about three to four feet tall. And from this stalk grow off branches which bear fruit. And the vine dresser, Jesus says, I am the true vine. So Jesus is the stalk. He is the trunk. And off of him grow the branches that produce the fruit. And my father is the, the gardener, the vine dresser. The amount of fruit that a vineyard produces for its owner and the quality of that fruit is seen as a reflection on the ability of the gardener, of the vine dresser. He cares for that, those plants in such a way as to be considered never ending diligence, up at the crack of dawn, watching, waiting, controlling the environment as he can, controlling the situation with the plants as best he can. Whatever he has to do for those branches that are drawing their life from the vine to produce more fruit, that is what he will do. Whatever he has to do, he will do. What is it that needs to be done to produce more fruit? And as we look at verse 8 of chapter 15, the word says that this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So, the vine dresser, God the Father, tends the branches of the vine, the true vine, which is Jesus. And as we go back to the very, to verse 2, I'll read it again from the beginning. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now, I don't know about you, but I've read that verse many times, and I find it troubling, condemning, harsh. Haven't you, have you ever gone through a season in your life where you felt fruitless, or really didn't feel like you were doing or being productive in the kingdom of God, or bearing fruit to the glory of the Father? You may be walking in the desert, in a wasteland, you may be, you may be in the valley, and so the way that this is translated, he's going to cut you off because you're not fruitful, because you bear no fruit. But what Jesus says here is he says he cuts off every branch in me. Now, if we are in Christ, if I am in Christ, my salvation has been given to me as a gift. It is a gift that God gives to me that I have received. Jesus lives in me. He will not cut me off from the kingdom. And the heart of the message here this morning is what that word, and my father, um, he cuts off every branch. The word in the Greek is aero. And here, in the NIV, it's translated, cuts off. In the King James Version, and New King James Version, I'm not sure about the King James Version, but in the New King James Version, it says, takes away. He takes away every branch in me that bears no fruit. I'm here to say to you that there's a deeper message here that's important for you to understand about the word. The word aero means to lift up, means to raise, 
Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. Turn with me if you'd like. Talking about the temptation of Jesus by the devil, and says, The devil took him up to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up. They will aero you in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And in Matthew 9, 6, it talks about Jesus healing a paralytic. And this may sound familiar. Now, go. Pick up your mat. You are healed. Lift up your mat. Pick up your mat. And in Matthew 14, 20, after Jesus fed the 5,000, the disciples aerode. Twelve baskets of loaves and fishes. The remnants, they picked up. And this is the word here that is translated, he cuts off every branch, or he takes away every branch. A better understanding, if we look at it in light of what the vine dresser does, he lifts up a branch that is unproductive. Young branches of the three to four foot tall Vine, grape bush, they have a tendency to grow down. And when they grow down, they are close to the dust of the earth, and they get dusty, and they don't get as much light, and they don't get as much air. And if it rains, these branches that hang low, these young branches that hang low, they get wet damp, moldy, mildew, not enough air, not enough light, covered with dust, which now becomes a mucky cakey. And what does the vine dresser do? He reaches down and he lifts them up. You see? The difference between cuts off, there, we're going to talk about pruning in a minute, because pruning is a different process. He lifts the vine up, and he secures it, maybe to a stronger branch above, perhaps to a trellis. Perhaps he'll even put a separate stake in the ground, which he can secure that branch to. And he cleans it off. This is from the words of a vine dresser in California. That's what I do, he says. I pick it up because... Every grape that comes off of that vine, off of those branches, is valuable to him. It's all about the pounds of grapes. And he works diligently to make sure that every vine can produce as much fruit as it's possibly designated to do so. It's a reflection on his abilities. It's a reflection on his pride. And so Jesus says... He lifts up every branch in me that bears no fruit. So that branch which is not being productive, he takes care of it in a way so that it can become fruit-bearing. It can become productive. And I go this way because right after that, he says, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. So once that branch has been lifted up, cleaned off, secured, given more light, more air, more opportunity to be productive, he takes that and it starts to grow and it starts to, and he makes it stronger by a little pruning that goes on here and there. And then Jesus turns to his disciples personally. In the beginning, he's talking about all believers in the first two verses. And then he says in verse 3, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Do you see? You have already been lifted up. You have already been cleaned off. And we are cleaned off. They were cleaned off by the words that Jesus had spoken to them. 
And remember, he said to them, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit will remind them of their words. You are already clean. And that word clean means pure, unstained, either literally or, ceremonial, or ceremonially or spiritually. You're guiltless, you're innocent, you're upright. And you're going to remember all of the words that I have spoken to you in the time that you need to remember them in order to bear fruit. A deeper look into the meaning of that word translated as clean means without admixture, without undesirable elements. Clean because, spiritually clean because you have been purged or purified by God, free from the contaminating, contaminating, soiling influences of sin. And so we are clean by the word which the Spirit makes alive in us, helps us to bear fruit. There are believers who bear no fruit. He lists four different types. Believers who bear no fruit, While every branch that does bear fruit, so there are no fruit bearers, there are, bearers, uh, there are branches that do bear fruit, and after they are pruned, they bear more fruit. And finally, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Much fruit. We should want to glorify the Father by bearing fruit through the Son. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is fruit of the Spirit. And I kind of want this message to go on for more than one week. But it's too early. So I have no notes on this, so I'm shooting from the hip here. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. This is a verse we spent a little time on before. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And Titus, chapter 3, I believe... Chapter 3, verse 14 of Titus. Our people, in other words, the people who they minister to in the church, in the body, must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good. Also translated, to do good works. In order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives. Good works, fruitful lives. Good works, fruitful lives. Both of those. And in the word, in, in, the, in the verse in Ephesians, for we are God's workmanship. That is a continual process of workmanship. I don't know if you can remember when we went through Ephesians last year or so. We talked about that word and it has to do with the creative process. 
that God does, the recreation in our souls, for you are a new creation in Christ. And the work that he is doing inside us as the vine dresser, as the cleaner by his word, as the lifter up to give us support and put us in a place where we can function better. It's continual. It's never ending diligence on his part. Never ending diligence. And so you can see when we bear no fruit or we go through a time, he doesn't cut us off. No, he lifts us up. And he helps us to become more productive. And after that, we begin to bear fruit. Then comes the little snip here and the little snip there to give more strength to improve the situation once more. Once we begin to bear fruit, he starts to prune us. And after that, we bear more fruit. And who knows what the process is at that point in time. Perhaps the, the disciples, you know, even, even in our frailties, even in our sinfulness, we can still bear fruit. Even though we're not perfect and perfected, and we do not display every single one of those attributes of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, you can still bear fruit for the Father's glory. Kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It's easy to be kind if you allow yourself. It's easy to be gentle but not for everybody. I was talking with my pastor friends this past week about the hammer and, you know, not gentle. And Pastor Bob Howard said, you got to have like a tinker's hammer and you just got to go tick, 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 tick. You got to speak the truth in love. Tick, 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 tick. Hammer, it's easier and more fulfilling. <laughs> But good works are tied to fruitfulness. Don't think that just because, uh, don't just limit fruitfulness to bringing droves to the kingdom of God, giving witness, being an evangelist, bringing souls into the kingdom. When you are in a situation in your real world life, and you can bring kindness into that situation, or patience, or gentleness into that situation with a person who you are called to be with. For God has, is preparing us, He's, we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, to do the works that he has prepared in us for advance to do. Think about the idiot that you're going to meet at so and such and such and such a place tomorrow and they're going to just push your button and the Holy Spirit bringing into remembrance, consider others better than yourselves. Can produce a fruit in that moment, in that situation that you, can, you don't necessarily see. You're the branch. It's popping off of you. It's Good works produced out of the fruit of the Spirit produce fruit. Makes us fruitful for the kingdom of God. And bring glory to the Father. That's what it's all about. He gave us our salvation. He gave us the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave His Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but should have eternal life. Praise God. It is a free gift. It is not of ourselves. It is nothing that we have to earn. And once we become a little budding shoot off of that strong stalk of a vine, he gently lifts us up when we need to be lifted up and he gently cleans us off and he puts us in a situation where we are more able to produce fruit for him, for his glory and for his honor. Amen.
And now, this blessing to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, and now and forevermore. Amen.